I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we'll meet today and tomorrow and to honour their continuing connection to the land, to the sea and to community. I wish to pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. I'd also like to welcome everyone here today and thank you for coming. Most of you know me, I'm Cherie Lamb, the Program Leader from the Embrace Culture and Kindy Program run by QCOS and I'd like to first give my apologies for Mark Henley, our Chief Executive Officer who can't be with us today and um, he, does, he does send his, his regrets and apologies. We have a wonderful lineup of presenters for you and a good balance of presentations and interactive sessions so that everyone can be an active rather than a passive conference participant. Please find comprehensive programs in your bags and I'd like to thank JJ Stanton from Global Kids Oz for donating those bags. And the session outlines for both days are followed by notes about the presenters at the back of the programs. Presentations will be followed by question time at the end of the session and we'll have two keynote speakers before morning tea on each day and then um, we'll have morning tea at 10.30. And if you could be back promptly at 11 uh, because we MDA are going to be running an interactive session um, at 11 o'clock today. Uh, if you haven't found the toilets yet, they're just there. Um, and don't forget, if you came a bit late and you didn't see those lovely uh, stalls and, and the Multicultural Expo in the Carpentaria Room, please uh, enjoy those during the breaks. And if you haven't yet registered for your concurrent sessions, both today and tomorrow, the registration forms are out there. And when we've seen who's registered, then we can allocate the rooms uh, dependent on size. So, I love being an Australian. The first reason I love being an Australian is that I live in a country with the longest living culture in the entire world. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have lived here for tens of thousands of years with deep connections to and great respect for this land. This is something of which I can be proud. And I believe as a nation, this is one of our greatest strengths. The second reason I love being an Australian is because Australia is a, a diverse, multicultural nation in Queensland alone, 22% of people were born overseas and a further 36% have a parent born overseas. We speak over 220 languages and that doesn't include all of our indigenous languages. With a nation, we are a nation of people who've extended our hearts to welcome over 800,000 refugees who've been displaced by war and civil upheaval since 1945. We're continuing in this tradition to welcome 12,000 Syrian refugees who've been rendered hope homeless by the current civil war in that country. Our incredible diversity, our tolerance of people from many faiths and cultures, and our linguistic diversity are our national strengths. The Australian values of equality and giving people a fair go are enviable to people around the world and I believe that we have much to teach the world about religious tolerance, unity and diversity, and social cohesion. My own ancestors arrived in Australia in leg irons and chains on leaky boats between 18, 1788 and 1804 at His Majesty's pleasure. After serving their time, they were able to shake off not only their chains, but also the rigid class and caste system that formed part of the fabric of the old world, which didn't allow people from impoverished backgrounds to rise above their station. In Australia, all things became possible. In fact, Australians now believe that earning a decent living and getting a good education are inalienable rights. Whilst we take these rights for granted, they do not extend to all. And there is a trend towards a widening gap 
between children from differing social strata within Australian society. And we know from many years of international research and through our own experience that children who profit most from education begin before the age of five. Quality early childhood programs in the year before school lay the foundations for a child's long-term <coughs> health, educational, employment and well-being outcomes. They increase a child's readiness for school and they enhance a child's cognitive, behavioural, social and language skills. Quality early childhood programs are a key approach to addressing poverty and disadvantage, producing multiple social and economic benefits, and these benefits are transgenerational. Early childhood programs are also very cost effective. For every dollar spent in early childhood, between seven and ten dollars is saved by children not needing remedial programs, not needing out of home care, and not needing juvenile detention later in life. So the Embrace team at QCOS have been working with our nine pre-kindergarten grants program partners in 14 priority locations in Queensland since late 2013. Um, and consistent with the literature, families from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and linguistically diverse and culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds are still underrepresented um, in early childhood programs due to a range of structural, cultural, trauma-related and attitudinal barriers. And parents are often ill-equipped to make choices about early childhood education within this complex and fragmented early childhood sector in Queensland. And some of the barriers that um, have emerged as we've uh, run this program, come in, find a seat. Uh, the, the cost of kindergarten is still prohibitive and um, for many families, waiting list fees further serve to prevent, prevent access to vulnerable families. Many families don't have transport, um, and public transport options are quite limited in some areas. Subsidies are poorly understood, and the paperwork can be stigmatising for families who don't read English well. <coughs> and there's no ESL provision in Queensland, or um, and we know that interpreters are rarely used. So at this conference, we will explore the strategies that educators and family support workers use to work with families from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and culturally diverse backgrounds to encourage participation in kindergarten and other early childhood programs. We hope to utilise the findings from this conference to formulate and extend our policy response to increase access to early childhood programs for these families. Our first keynote speaker this morning is Rhonda Livingston. Rhonda is the national education leader for the, children, the Australian Children's Education and Care Quality Authority, better known as the CEQA. Rhonda brings a wealth of experience to the role, having worked in preschools and long day care centres as, as an assessor of programs and services for both the Queensland Government and the Creche and Kindergarten Association of Queensland. Rhonda's extensive involvement in the national quality agenda reforms saw her contribute to the development of the national quality standard and its guide, the assessment and rating tools and processes, and the training and testing program for authorised officers. Rhonda has also worked as a senior advisor for ASEQA and as a sessional academic with the University, Queensland University of Technology. Rhonda's address today is titled how the National Quality Framework supports the inclusion of children and families from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds in early childhood services. And I must apologise because Rhonda has a very squeaky voice today. She's not well. Um, so please welcome Rhonda to the conference. Sorry about my voice. 
for those of you in the room who know me, um, you probably know that I love singing karaoke. It truly wasn't karaoke that did it to me. I don't want to <laughs> So I apologise. Um, and I would just like to say, just start by saying how much I enjoyed uh, um, Uncle Des's address. I just find him inspiring and motivating and having lived in the land for more than five decades. I don't want you to think I'm old, but a awfully long time. Um, I learned so much about the land that I have on by listening to Uncle um, Des the first time I, I met him just around the corner in the Aspie Bo Memorial Bowls Club. So I'm really excited to be invited by Sharia Renu. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk about something that I feel really passionate about. And I was really lucky to be involved in the development of the National Quality Standard and the National Quality Framework. And we really saw um, the inclusion of children, all children, but particularly children of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, backgrounds as a really key part of the whole process. So. with a, um, a quote from the Early Years Learning Framework and the My Time Our Place Framework for School Age Care, talking about inclusion, just in recognition of how important inclusion was in terms of the development of those two frameworks. And of course that flowed through into the development of the Queensland Kindergarten Learning Guideline and I know that services that are funded as part of that program are required as a funding requirement to implement the um, Queensland Kindergarten Learning Guideline that aligns beautifully with the Early Years Learning Framework. For those of you at the back, it might be a bit difficult to read. So I'll just read it for you. Inclusion involves taking into account all the children's social, cultural and linguistic diversity. The intent is to ensure that all children's experiences are recognised and valued and that children have equitable access to resources and participation and opportunities to de demonstrate their learning and to de and value difference. So these, um, these principles are woven throughout the whole National Quality Framework the Early Years Learning Framework and the My Time, Our Place, but also the National Quality Standard, uh, the regulatory standards that underpin the whole process. So in today's session, I'm just going to have a, a quick overview of the role of a CEQA. Many of you will be familiar with the role of a CEQA, but it might be just uh, useful to reiterate some of our key functions and also to talk about the links between inclusion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and children from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds and how that's embedded in the National Quality Framework. And also, I just wanted to talk a little about how we at ASEQA are working with our colleagues in state and territory regulatory authorities and also big organisations like QCOS and the professional support coordinators, inclusion support agencies and the Indigenous professional support units to support educators and services to understand um, the requirements of the National Quality Framework and the, and the learning frameworks and to implement them as well. I'd also like to really share with you some practice examples. In my team at ASEQA we have the role of assessing applications for excellence and so we're seeing some amazing examples of some great practice in terms of inclusion. So I wanted to just share those with you, as well as some of the resources that are around to support educators in this journey. So we've got a really important role in terms of um, supporting the implementation of the consistent implementation of the National Quality Framework which sounds pretty straightforward, 
But in reality, it's quite complex because consistency doesn't mean all the same. We don't think that a service in Bamaga should look like a service in CBD Sydney or Melbourne. We recognise, I think, the strength of the National Quality Framework is that it recognises the context in which the service is being offered. And that's a really important part of the whole process of assessment. And that's why we put up there first observation followed by discussion and documentation is meant to support the whole process but it's not meant to overtake the whole process. So we also um, do lots of work with our colleagues in the regulatory authorities and we've just most recently been working with them and the Professional Support Coordinator Alliance to roll out some national workshops around Quality Area 1, Education Program and Practice. And we delivered those in 60. Um, in, we delivered 60 workshops across Australia from everywhere from Uluru to, um, to Kansas, Northern Queensland. And now we're working with them on a second round and cultural, in, um, cultural competence, agency of the child and educational leaderships are the key areas that we're focusing on. As I said, we also have a role in assessing applications for excellence. And to, to be able to apply for an excellent rating, you need to have received a rating of exceeding overall. And then you need to really identify what it is that makes your service outstanding. So we're not looking at the same kinds of criteria as we look at in the assessment and rating process. We are really looking for those key things that make your service stand out. And there's been some great examples of fantastic practice in terms of inclusion. And I'll share some of those with you. And we've also got a really important role in terms of informing and educating the sector and the broader community about the importance of early childhood education and care. And so that's why I'm part of the reason I'm here today. So I just think it is really important to reiterate the guiding principles that underpin the whole National Quality Framework. Sheree mentioned that I was involved in writing the National Standard and when we sat around a group, there was about seven of, of us all around Australia, including two of our colleagues from the National Child Care Accreditation Council and they were so generous in sharing their knowledge and understanding. We started off saying children, and then we had in brackets in children, including children from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander background, including children <coughs> from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, including children with a disability. And it started to sound so tokenistic. So we turned it around and said every child, because we really believe that every child should have the same high quality experiences in services. And we sat down and we thought, well, what are the guiding principles that we think should um, permeate through every part of our, our work and also so should inform our decision making. And so you can see that the guiding principles include one around equity, inclusion and diversity underpins the framework <coughs> that Australia's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures are valued. It also recognises the role of families and parents and it also um, has an expectation around best practice. I talked a little about the um, approved learning frameworks. The belonging being become early years learning framework for early years learning framework and the my time our place framework for school age care really have um, supported inclusive practices and some of the key Um, there's lots of links in the learning outcomes. In outcome one, there's lots of links in terms of children developing a strong sense of identity, feeling safe, secure and supported, developing their emerging autonomy and independence. In outcome two, children are connected with and contributing to their world. Excuse me, I'm just going to cough. 
children and a quality area to children are connected with and contribute with the world. They include outcomes like children develop a sense of belonging to groups and communities and an understanding of the reciprocal rights and responsibilities necess necessary for active community participation. Another one relates to children responding to diversity with respect and becoming aware of the fairness, becoming socially responsible and showing respect for the environment. In terms of outcome three, there's lots of links in terms of children becoming strong in their social and emotional well-being. Outcome four, children are confident and involved learners. There's links to children resourcing their own learning through connecting with people, with place, with technologies and natural and processed materials. In terms of outcomes, outcome five, children are effective communicators. There's outcomes embedded in this um, outcome around children expressing ideas and making meaning using um, a range of media. And cultural competence is a key practice promoted in each of the frameworks. And the frameworks recognise that this is a journey and promote embedded rather than tokenistic practices. And that's a really um, important message that we're trying to get out in terms of the journey. And um, um, some of you in the room may have participated in some of the, the yarn up sessions that were um, organised by the professional support coordinators in Queensland. And I have to say, I did one of those yarn up sessions and it was one of the, the best professional development opportunities I had because, you know, all the research is saying it's great to hear people like me standing here talking for a period of time, but if you want sustained change, uh, models like um, the yarn up sessions work really well. And I was really fortunate to have um, Mary Graham in our session and I just appreciated her openness and honesty. So even though I've got to jump on a plane, I'm going to stay to listen to, um, to Mary tomorrow because I just think she's such an inspiring, like Uncle Des, um, absolutely inspiring leaders in our community. And she was very generous in terms of her sharing. And I said to her, sometimes I think, and when I talk to educators, I think sometimes they get so worried about doing something wrong that it almost paralyzes us and, we, um, and we're frightened to do anything at all. And she was so open and honest about how to make the connections, um, uh, where to get information, and it really supported and encouraged each and every one of us in that group to think about how we can sustain, make some sustained change in our practice and make sure that we are uh, inclusive. But, also inclusion ready, being ready and able and willing and embracing inclusion, not just meeting the minimum regulatory standards, which the National Quality Framework recognises is a really important foundation. But we, we want services to do better than just meet the minimum regulatory um, standards. So again, this is a quote from the um, the frameworks, the learning frameworks, belonging, being, becoming, and the my time, our place. They describe it, cultural competence as educators who are culturally competent respect multiple cultural ways of knowing, seeing, and living. Celebrate the benefits of diversity and have an ability to understand and honor differences. This is evident in everyday practice when educators demonstrate an ongoing commitment to developing their own cultural competence in a two-way process with families and communities. So there is a recognition that it is a, um, a two-way process. So I just want to share with you some of the examples of embedded practice that I've seen in my travels and conversations with educators, including this. Um, I was in a preschool in... Um, Canberra just recently and I went into the preschool room and the preschool children had developed their own acknowledgement of country. So 
this was in Koala's preschool room. I'll read it for the people down the back who might be struggling to see it. It says, Thank you to the Aboriginal people who owned and took care of the land where we learn each day, Ngunnawal people. Thank you for sharing your country with us and for helping us to learn. We promise to take care of the land and share it with everybody. And I'm told that um, in speaking with the educators, they said that the children came up with the um, this acknowledgement themselves. They wrote the words, not the educators. And one little boy coming in um, to the service with his father one morning, his father kicked a rock and the boy said, you can't do that. That's not ours. We have to look after it. And another child told their parent not to squash the bugs because they promised to look after the animals and the land. The educator's guide, we talk a lot about the frameworks, but I think sometimes we forget that there are other resources that can support in terms of our journey and the educator's guide to both the being, belonging, becoming. Belonging, being, becoming, and my time, our place. I have some really good examples of um, some stories. But first, I'm going to just have a look at this um, example from Summerhill Children's Centre. And this was showcased at a, um, at a workshop just recently. hosted by Children's Services Centric, Central sorry, and the Ethnic Community Services Cooperative just recently. And for me, that only um, not only suggests embedded practice, but it also suggests to me that the educators are seeing children as capable and competent, which is another key principle of the, um, the National Quality Framework. So I mentioned that the Educator's Guide um, to the Frameworks also has some really useful resources for educators in terms of translating theory into practice. And um, I noticed that there's a really good learning story in there. And it's an example that links to children being confident and involved learners using the corona lang language in early childhood. And this um, learning story, I know you can't read it, but I just wanted to highlight that there are lots of resources up there. But it's, it's a learning story about the, how the educators have reflected on the traditional owners of the land on which the service is built and included the local dialect in their practice. They started by naming the Australian animals in Karana and English and using them in songs, rhymes and games to include their children's families. They sent home toys with the um, Karana names. Well, this is an example of a small change in practice. It's engaging with the local um, Indigenous community and families and um, making a commitment to the local language. There are lots of other examples in the, uh, of educators 
stories in those resources. We've also been in lots of work with Reconciliation Australia and promoting um, the idea of um, services developing their own Reconciliation Action Plan. I don't know if you've seen recently the um, Rec Reconciliation Australia website has a great program to support educators in schools, but also there's a one specifically for early childhood to develop a Reconciliation Action Plan. And it's not meant to be tokenistic, so you can't just um, cut and paste, put your service name on top of another service name. You have to go through a certain number of steps um, before um, a reconciliation plan for your service is generated. So it does support in terms of um, developing a deeper understanding and a commitment to, to the reconciliation plan, not just ticking the box that you've got. We've also worked closely with our authorised officers throughout Australia. We have um, training programs that authorised officers have to, to um, <coughs> successfully complete, but, but then they also have to set a reliability test mm -hmm. before they're allowed to assess and rate. And we, um, we're, each year they have to set a drift test. They get really anxious about reliability test so I used, I used to send to them I'm reliable watch me rate it's a prescriptive checklist that I hate as I spread the NQS across the land oh yes I'm wise but it's wisdom that is shared started off brunette and now I'm silver hand <laughs> <laughs> don't tell Helen ready I ruined her song. <laughs> but we do take really seriously training of authorised officers and um, we think it's really important that we have regular um, updates for them so we send out a regular um, RA, regulatory authority update. We have guidance notes. We work closely with organisations like SNAKE to make sure that our authorised officers have um, up-to-date information. and. Um, to make sure that they they know what to look for when they're ass assessing against the elements in the National Quality Standard that relate to inclusion. So I'm just going to take a look now at um, some of the data that we've got on the website. Uh, in terms of um, some of the standards relating to inclusion. So we recognise that um, in embedding in the curriculum decision-making process that importance of knowing children and, and being aware of their, um, their identity and their connection with community. When I look at the number of services that have been assessed and rated up to the 1st of October 2015, 92% of services were meeting that, that element. In terms of element 1.2 around um, including each child's current knowledge uh, ideas, culture, abilities, it was again 92%. Um, element 1.5 asks that every child be supported to participate and that's full, fully participate in the program. 96% of services have been assessed and rated. Got that one. In terms of quality area 5, each child is supported to feel secure, confident and included, 97%. The dignity and rights of children are maintained at all times, 96% currently. Um, we recognise that working in collaboration with uh, families and communities is really important, making information available um, and a continuity of learning and transitions. It's, they're all up in the high 90s. <clears throat> so just before we go to this video, we're actually thinking you know, initially we're thinking, oh, that's good. We're doing some really good things around inclusion, making, facilitating access for inclusion support agencies, making information available for families. But we're actually just looking at that data and, and taking a long, hard look at how we support authorised officers and the sector to understand. Is it that the authorised officers are collecting the, the right information? Because I'm not sure that those high figures actually reflect what's happening in practice. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're having lots of conversations with people like Adam Duncan. Um, Adam was an educator working in a ACT service. 
that received excellence because of the um, great work they were doing in terms of linking with the local Indigenous community. And Amy Tate, and I just thought I'd share this conversation that they were having about. So I think it's really important that educators find some point of connection to spark their passion for reconciliation and reconciliation work with young people. Um, something as simple as going around the country and thinking about the park down the road or the reserve down the road as being Aboriginal land um, and thinking, reflecting on the culture that has been there for thousands and thousands of years is a starting point. And I think also speaking as a non-Indigenous person who teaches children Indigenous perspectives, it can be challenging and very overwhelming to start with anything, but I think that you make a good point when you say that if you're passionate about it, the children are going to pick up on it. The reality is that we're not going to have the traditional knowledge in order to be able to teach it, so it has to come from a contemporary sense and a contemporary perspective as well. It can be done through story or art or being on country or um, music. Um, there are so many different avenues for educators to be able to explore this particular topic. Mm. And I think that um, doing it from a contemporary sense is also something that is really important yeah. to be aware and of. As you were saying, if, if art is going to be your, your avenue in, your point of connection, um, another good starting point is to actually broaden your knowledge about what Aboriginal art is. Um, and speaking beyond Papanya Tula and speaking beyond X-ray art from uh, Arnhem Land, looking at contemporary Aboriginal artists and looking at the messages and the politics of contemporary Aboriginal art mm -hmm. is another way, another starting point. Um, don't get stuck on dots. Um, and when I was talking to him, he was always talk, also talking about the fact that um, it, it can, is so disrespectful when services just go up on um, uh, NAIDOC week or whatever to um, uh, connect with their um, local Indigenous communities. And he talked about the importance of developing those relationships and having a long-term respectful relationship, not just kind of time, trying to tap in and, um, into those connections when it's NAIDOC week. And one of the examples that I just wanted to highlight was a service in Queensland called Porky Kids Early Learning Centre. And they developed an effective partnership with their Indigenous community by finding out about the history of the area. The journey began three years ago after staff attended a course at the Hidden Histories, where the histories of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples were explored. Attending this course prompted educators at the service to reflect on their practice and develop a plan to more effectively include Indigenous perspectives into their program. And I remember when we were writing the National Quality Standard, we were linking with some academics across the world, and we linked up with um, Sharon Lynn Kagan in the in um, in the states early one morning, and she was talking about the fact that she had come and visited services in Australia. She said when she came, she saw examples of um, other cultures, but she said she found it really difficult to find examples of Indigenous culture in her, in the early childhood services that she visited. So as part of the journey, this service actively cultivates relationships with its Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community members involving local elders in the program authentically seeking and, in value, and valuing the input of local families and supporting participation of children from their Indigenous community. Another example is one in, from Victoria. Um, it's the Jindy Warabak Children's Centre. And again, this is another of the services that have, has been rated excellent. And they developed a partnership with the Indigenous Studies Unit at Victoria University. 
This supported educators to embed a respectful and authentic Indigenous program into everyday practice. The program of art, story, song, dance, music and visits from Indigenous groups and individuals promotes and sustains family and child connection to land and country through links to Australian Indigenous heritage. A key to both Torquay Kids and Jindy Warabek's excellent practice is that the children's experiences of celebrating their local Indigenous cultures is not limited to special occasions. It's part of their everyday learning. Another example comes from Victoria as well. It's Hometown Children's Centre and it's a multicultural hub within its diverse community. <coughs> and educators create a sense of belonging for families <coughs> in their community by embracing and accommodating their different beliefs and practices. And the family supports, the service support families to share their culture in the parent group <coughs> and include important cultural celebrations as part of the program. And educators encourage families to share their special talents, such as music and telling stories. And the service takes into account children's different, tree, um, different dietary requirements by providing all kinds of different foods and, and providing um, photos of menus for families who have difficulties in understanding uh, English. And the educators work hard to ensure that families understand the information provided and they look for lots of different ways to communicate to find the most effective way to share information. So for example, by having a conversation with a speaker of both languages present or translating written material. So we've got lots of um, examples. Um, there's another example on the AITSOL, the Australian Institute for Teaching and School Leadership. Across Australia's regulatory authorities are looking at how they can embed um, early childhood teachers as part of it, um, the registration process. There's work happening in New South Wales and Victoria currently to um, uh, include early childhood teachers as part of that registration process. So we're working with AITSL because there's not a lot of examples in terms of their illustrations of practice that reflect early childhood settings. So this is one example. It's from Atherton Gardens Preschool and it's an example of practice that's... Um, My name's Chris Wright. I'm a kindergarten teacher here at Atherton Gardens Kindergarten. Uh, we're situated in inner city Fitzroy underneath uh, one of the Commission Flats Towers. Our kindergarten services uh, a wide range of cultural mix of children. It's very rewarding working in this setting. Uh, from the beginning of the year, the changes that the children go through are quite amazing. Their confidence grows. The relationship with the parents is really rewarding. You can see how they love to see their children coming to kindergarten and this in turn helps the children's confidence uh, when they're dealing in a variety of social situations. It's fantastic to just enjoy the, the growth that we see in the children throughout the year. The children's language development, the independence skills. I do enjoy my group time. It does bring the children together. It means I can explain and we can talk about concepts and things together. It's also a good social time for children to learn how to uh, deal with each other. Uh, sharing skills. Chris's rapport with the children is really lovely to see. He's very hands-on, down to their level, lots of eye contact and lots of non-verbal cues. Um, he's very demonstrative with children and uses beautiful props like singing and dancing um, to get their attention and to get their trust. The group time today was we uh, were dealing with opposites so I try to incorporate in my group time a variety of areas and if you can provide some music, a story, some games, they all contribute to the skills that you're trying to teach the children. <laughs> By starting with a, a song, often the children hear that as well and they realise, oh, it's time to come and sit down. I do love playing the guitar with the children. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, way of 
engaging the children in what's going on, and you can use it in a variety of ways. You can use it for language skills, it can be used for rhythm skills, it can also use used just to bring people together. We like to try and encourage as much descriptive language as we can. Now we're here to talk about uh, Imran and Imran's progress through the year. Part of the uh, end of year process is that we do a transition and learning statement, development statement. Just looking at his birthday there, he's very young, but he has coped extremely well at kindergarten with a lot of issues that we've had to deal with here at kindergarten. I'm really happy with the way he comes forward. He's really quite confident to come and speak to his teachers, and that will really help him next year at school. You know, he's, he's a very independent person that's not really worried about what other people think. He just does the right things. For that reason, and also his general knowledge, his skills level, he's really doing extremely well in is a very confident communicator who expresses his needs happily to his teachers, readily. How do you feel that uh, the year's been for you? So. I think he learned a lot and he um, he's very happy with the way he is and he is fine. Chris is a very visible presence on the Atherton Gardens housing estate. He goes to families' homes, he's out in the community, he goes to the playgrounds, he goes to the local primary school and he goes to other local outreach services that provide support. And I suppose that's where his greatest strength lies in the way that he disseminates information to families and the community about his program. He thinks very laterally. We understand that not all families um, have English as a first language and he, where often it's impossible to get things translated, he will ask community members to come in and do that for him or he'll ask a family member to come down and translate for him. He thinks very much out of the box um, in terms of how he gets information across. So there's some really good, sorry, there's some really good examples of um, some great practices that are happening. There's also lots of um, really useful resources to support uh, educators in the programs. Um, and if you're working in a kindy program that is funded by the Queensland government, um, QCOS does some great work in terms of resources. On our CEQA website, we've got a whole range of resources as well. And I've just started a National Education Leader webpage. I update the webpage monthly. But I'm really cognizant of the fact that there's such a lot of rich resources out there that um, I try not to duplicate, but I try to just write a little short article because I recognise that you're also time poor um, and link it to some of the great resources that are out there. So, for example, I don't know if you've discovered the IPSP, the Inclusion and Professional Support Program Online Library. So the Inclusion and Professional Support Program includes the professional support coordinators, the inclusion support agencies, and the indigenous professional support units. All of those agencies across Australia have de developed a whole range of resources, and they're all available on the IPSP online library. And they've been all quality assured and updated, so that, if, for example, if Western Australia and Queensland had a similar resource, um, they chose the most contemporary, most and updated and put it on the website. But what I love about it is that it also includes all of the resources that were developed by the Early Childhood Australia Professional Learning Program, the ECAPLP, because we love acronyms. It also includes the ECAPLP resources, and states and territories have also linked their resources, as has a CEQA. So it's a really useful one-stop shop for resources. Um, so we've got lots on the CEQA website, also on the SNAKE website. There's some really useful <coughs> resources. I don't know if you've seen this one. ECA has got some great resources as well under the um, uh, Early Years Learning, the PLP program. 
hands on uh, understanding cultural competence. The Kids Matter has got some really useful resources, as well as this um, Cultural Connections booklet that was produced by Child Australia. They're the professional support coordinators uh, in Western Australia and Northern Territory, but all of these resources are freely available on their website. And we've got lots of resources and we shared some of, um, in your handouts, some of the website addresses to connect to those resources. So, I just quickly um, run through, and I apologise for A, the voice, B, the singing, and um, C, dropping the microphone. <laughs> but I've just quickly given you um, a run through of some of the, the um, underpinning um, support in terms of the National Quality Framework that, that we tried to build in to ensure that all children were included in early childhood programs. And I just thought it might be useful to finish um, with this quote. We all want children to grow up in a world free from bias and discrimination, to reach for their dreams and feel whatever they want to accomplish in life is possible. So, I'd just like to finish there unless anyone has any questions. Thank you. <coughs> I'd like to uh, thank Rhonda Livingston very much and I'd like to, um, to invite all of you to join me in thanking Rhonda first of all. your voice was um, was going this morning and then you're unwell. So thanks very much for coming and not cancelling on us. I do appreciate that. And um, one of the things I think that um, struck me about what Rhonda said was that we get so scared of doing something wrong that it paralyzes us. So can I encourage each and every one of you as a result of this conference to do something, to be bold, to make sustained changes in your practice and to become <coughs> inclusion ready.